Most of us have been through a breakup at least once, and most of us get over it and move on with our lives. But for some divorced couples, the acrimony and hostility are so bitter that their court cases never seem to end. Today on Family Matters, one of the most difficult and frustrating aspects of family law, high-conflict divorce. Experts tell us that of all the couples that break up, only 5% ever go to family court. Although that's reassuring, let me tell you that for many of those 5%, their disputes can go on for so long that the only way their files get closed is when their children become adults. In the family law world, these are called high conflict cases, and they are unquestionably the most toxic and challenging cases in the justice system. What is it about some separated parents that they just can't stop fighting? And how does the court system deal with these cases? Is there a way to better help high-conflict parents make peace instead of war? That's what we'll be exploring today. Let's meet our first guest, Dr. Richard Warshak, who's an internationally renowned psychologist specializing in high-conflict cases. He's also the author of a book which has become a classic in this subject. It's called Divorce Poison. Richard, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. I, uh, I, I must tell you that your book became an instant classic internationally in 2001 when it came out. I think it really touched the nerve. This is a, a form of mistreating children that really operates under the surface. It's hidden. A lot of people deny that it even exists. But there are many children out there who are being influenced and manipulated to take sides with one parent against the other. What is it about some people that they just can't accept that although we're not lovers, spouses anymore, we can still be co-parents? Well, sometimes the parent feels that they own the child. They, they don't think the other parent should have any role in the child's life. Sometimes it's a way for a parent to convince themselves that they're superior to the other parent. Uh, there are a lot of different motives, but they all lead the parent to feel that they need to declare war and that the children need to be soldiers in this war and taking sides with them against the other parent. And that's what we call parental alienation, isn't it? Yes, that is. Parental alienation refers both to the state of the children where they feel disconnected, cut off, contemptuous of a parent, and it also refers to the behavior of a parent who's doing this to the children. Now, I've been a, a family court judge for 18 years, and in my experience, and I have to tell you, judges talk about this all the time, we have the impression that the number of high conflict cases is increasing in recent years, and the intensity of the conflict is higher. Are you seeing that too? That's my impression. You know, we can't tell for sure because we don't have good statistics on this, but we're, we're hearing more about these cases. I'm certainly hearing more from parents about this, and the effects are getting more devastating. Parents are going to more extremes. I, you know, I wrote my book about the psychological poison, but I've had cases now where par where parent actually coaches the children to attempt to poison the other parent. Oh. There are homicides associated with parental alienation where a child is given a gun and, and feels that the only solution is to get rid of this hated parent. And I, I find that it's happening with very, very, very young children. You know, it seems to me that so many relationships now are very short. People meet online, they didn't really know each other very well, they, they have a relationship, they produce a child, and then they break up very quickly, sometimes even before the child's born or right after. Well, in those situations, there had never really been a solid relationship, so no trust was ever built. There's no sense then on the part of one parent that the other parent is even needed. Very often it would be a, a mother. If she's not married to the father, she wants to get on with her life, and she doesn't see a role for the father in her child's life. And it can also occur 
with fathers alienating children against mothers, too. That's, that's true. I hear almost as much from mothers who are victims of this problem, who have been cut off from their children, despite having been very involved, very loving mothers. You know, one of the ways to identify a case of, of an irrational rejection of a parent uh, compared to children who have good reasons to reject a parent is that there had previously been a very positive and loving relationship. And the only thing that's changed is that the couple break up and one parent decides to exact revenge by turning the children against the other parent. Do you think that there's mental illness underlying some of this behavior? For some parents, there is certainly for the more extreme cases. A parent may not even recognize the harm they're doing. They don't recognize that the children have a need for the other parent. Uh, the, the mother or father feels, I don't need that person anymore in my life, neither should the children. So is, for the people that have mental illness, is this treatable? What are the illnesses? Are they personality disorders or is it depression, anxiety? What's going on? Psychologists refer to personality disorders to describe people who have an ingrained pattern of behavior. And it's treatable, but that takes many years of treatment. In the meantime, the children are suffering because they're being exposed to all this conflict. Usually the better way to handle that is through the court systems. The courts really need to get involved and take a firm stand and let parents know that there will be consequences if they attempt to deprive their children of the love of the other parents. Well, you didn't think you were going to get away from this show without me asking you about your views on how the courts handle high-conflict cases. We're going to be discussing that right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to our discussion of high conflict divorce and our guest, Dr. Richard Warshak. Dr. Warshak, what do you think of how the courts handle high conflict custody disputes? This is not their most shining moment when it comes to custody cases. Courts really don't know how to handle this. They're not very effective. They allow the cases to go on too long. The biggest complaint I hear from parents is that the courts are not doing a good job enforcing their own orders. So if you could reinvent the court system, design it from scratch, what would it look like? Well, the first thing I'd want is I want more education built in so we can prevent these problems from developing because when the problems have already developed, they're much harder to deal with than to prevent them from coming up in the first place. You are talking about educating the parents, not the judges. I'm talking about educating the parents, but oh. I'm talking about the judges having a hand in that, assigning materials to the parents to watch, assigning a divorce education class, and letting the parents know right at the outset that the court expects each parent to support the child's relationship with the other parent and that the court will not tolerate a parent withholding the child from the other parent. And what do you think a court should do when all of those messages are disregarded? Because I have to tell you, we do say those things. We try very hard in court to convey to parents that court orders matter, that bad behavior will not be tolerated. We make parents aware that parental alienation is child abuse and that if this is serious enough, we will call in the child protection authorities. Children can end up in foster care over it. But there is still a segment of the clientele that doesn't hear the message or can't absorb it. Part of that is that the courts aren't enforcing that. They, they make those threats, but then they don't follow through. They don't really treat it with the urgency that the court would treat it if they felt the child would be the victim of physical abuse in the home. These cases go on, as you mentioned earlier. They go on for years and years and years, and sometimes the child is cut off from a parent for that long before the court finally decides to make the parent who's fostering the alienation to have suffer some consequences. And what consequence do you suggest? One consequence is being deprived of some of the contact with the child or having that contact supervised so that the parent can get the message that it's not appropriate and it won't be tolerated to abuse the child in this way and to mistreat the child. It's a devastating impact on the kids. And if parents get away with it, then they continue to think they can get away with it in the future. I've also thought, though, that many of our parents are in so much pain, there's so much anger, there's such a feeling of betrayal that they really need counseling to try to 
let go of that emotional baggage that's preventing them from seeing the other parent as, uh, as a co-parent. If they get the counseling in the early stages of the separation and of all that anger, it can really help. It could, if you can help a parent realize how damaging it is to the children and ultimately can damage their own relationship with the children to be constantly bad-mouthing the other parent. The problem, though, is that when, when the child's alienation becomes so severe that the child wants to have nothing to do with the parent, and then the court refers the family to counseling, often the counseling can do more damage than good. Why? Well, for one thing, the, the child and the favored parent see the counselor's office as a place to continue to denigrate the other parent, to justify why that other parent has no value and shouldn't be able to see the children. Uh, and the more a child denigrates a parent publicly, the more they feel they've got to justify that by really convincing themselves that the parent really is bad as they've, as they've been saying. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that counselors can get drawn in to the warfare. They take sides. They believe mm -hmm. all the complaints being made about a parent, no matter how ridiculous they may be. Right. And, and then sometimes counselors even step over the line and make recommendations to the court about where the child should live when they really haven't done a proper assessment. So you've really got to be careful when you bring in other professionals that you're not inflaming the situation and making it worse. Right. You need to make sure and the courts need to make sure that if they're appointing a professional to work with the family, that professional understands the problem of parental alienation, understands that children can sound very convincing when they complain about a parent and, and say that they don't want to have anything to do with that parent when in actuality the children are either being coached or very heavily influenced and identifying with one parent's negative views of the other parent. Now let's assume that a court does change custody because the alienating parent has behaved so badly that it's no longer in the child's best interest to live with that parent. What kind of supports are out there for children who have been brainwashed against the parent that they're now going to have to live with? Right. The, the, they need some help to make a safe transition. We have a program called Family Bridges. It's a workshop uh, that we offer to parents. It's a four-day workshop where the child and the rejected parent meet together and we help the child understand what has happened, what, the, what process the child has gone through to develop this hatred. And we help the child develop a more balanced view of both parents and to have more sympathy for both parents' position. We have a DVD we developed to help children understand that. Yes, I have that DVD. Here, it's called Welcome Back Pluto. Right. We we named it that because of uh, you know Pluto was a member of our family of planets and then has been demoted. And that's how these rejected parents feel. I call them Plutoed parents. They feel they've been demoted by their children. And we want to help the children repair the damaged relationship and get back their right to love and to be able to receive love from both parents. It, uh, it's very clear from reading your book that the damage that it can occur to children who've been turned against and poisoned by one parent against the other parent is very long-lasting. It can even affect their potential to have relationships in the future uh, when they grow up. When these children grow up, they have difficulty trusting others. When they realize what was done to them, they're very angry at the parent who manipulated them in this way for their own needs. But they're also angry with the parent they rejected. They think that parent should have done more. To, to win them over. And, uh, and sometimes there's nothing that parent could have done, but the children are still angry. They're depressed. They had been taught maybe that the, that the rejected parent didn't really love them, that they came from bad stock, they came from a bad parent, and that affects their own view of themselves. I really want to thank you, Dr. Warshak, not only for being here today, but for the incredible groundbreaking work you've done in writing your book, Divorce Poison. It is absolutely the uh, best piece of literature I've ever found that helps people understand how devastating parental alienation can be. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say that. When we come back, we will be in chambers with social worker Howard Hurwitz. Don't go away. We're in chambers with social worker Howard Hurwitz, who has over 30 years experience working with parents in high conflict situations. Howard, thanks for being on the show. Can you tell us about some of the situations that you have dealt with with your high conflict clients? 
Sure. High conflict couples are people that have difficulty disengaging from one another. Often these are situations where uh, parents are in conflict over parenting schedules. There may be concerns about uh, uh, the safety of the child when they're in the care of the other parent. But don't most couples express these kinds of concerns? Well, I mean, I'm in court every day. I hear parents all the time say they think the other parent has a mental health problem according to their definition. Well, that's true. Many of these situations, though, are uh, the, the parent, one parent is unrelenting in their concern about the other parent. And are they exaggerated concerns? Uh, sometimes they are. Sometimes uh, they're not. What we want to do is understand whether the concerns that the parent has is as serious or severe as, um, as is claimed. And what, what are some of the things that people do in a high conflict situation that impact on a child? Well, they may make allegations and counter allegations um, uh, of the other parent. They may talk negatively about the other parent in front of the child. So they badmouth the child. Absolutely. Uh, they may um, undermine they deny the access. That's right. They'll deny access. They'll undermine the parent's effectiveness. They'll say to the child, "You're not safe with your mother or your father, so you have to call me if there's a problem." So they're undermining the child's relationship with the other parent. Absolutely. Now, what does this do to a child who's caught in the middle of this kind of conflict? Well, it inspires a sense of, of fear with the child. Um, often, the child may may worry when they're in the care of the of the that other parent. They may develop um, symptoms of uh, anxiety. Uh, they may feel sad. They may feel that when they're with the other parent, they're not allowed to have a good time, or they can't be comfortable. So there may be a sense of loyalty to the the parent, the other parent, um, and they may be caught in in, in um, um, a bind around, should I love mom or should I love dad? And so because whenever they're not th allowed to love both. That's right. When what I see sometimes in court, they don't. Children don't feel allowed to talk about what happened at the other parent's house in a good way. Right. Because the parent they're with doesn't want to hear about it. Absolutely. Um, sometimes you and know that's very that's damaging to a child. Damaging, right? and you know many of these kids are very conflicted, uh, and they grow up to be conflicted adults. They grow up with all kinds of emotional, behavioral, and psychological problems as well. So it's it's very um, stressful. Many of these kids also experience difficulties in school. Um, they may be uh, encountering difficulties in terms of their social relationships. And all because, it's not that there's anything wrong with these kids, it's that they're being exposed to two parents who just can't stop fighting. That's right. Well, at some point, this can become an issue for the child protection authorities. Absolutely. So when it becomes clear that the level of conflict between the parents is, is profound and the child is experiencing all kinds of emotional and behavioral problems. So you see acting out. Acting out. Aggressiveness, anger, that's trouble right. at school, that kind of thing. Depression. Sometimes these are the kids who uh, may want to self-harm as well. So they want to hurt themselves. So when it becomes so severe uh, and the parent's conflict is, is uncontrollable, then it becomes necessary to involve a child protection agency. What the Child Protection Agency will do will assess or investigate and try to help the parents uh, reduce the level of conflict. And they can even start a court case, right? Absolutely. I mean, I've seen cases in my years on the bench where we've had to take children away from parents who will not stop exposing their children to high conflict. Absolutely. I mean, what a child protection agency will try and do is try to coach or counsel the parents into reducing the conflict and, and demonstrating behaviors that are reflective of really good parenting, despite the fact that there's a separation or divorce. When but parents how? are unable I mean, to do that... But how do you do that? If they hate each other that much, and some of these people have been separated for years, isn't that right? Absolutely. And they still can't let go of whatever the anger is, the pain, the betrayal. How do you counsel them to move forward, let it go, just focus Focus on your child. Absolutely. So what you're trying to do is, is help parents understand the impact of the conflict on the child. You want to give them information. You want to share literature. You want to give them all kinds of resources that will be helpful to them. And when you can do that and when you see some positive changes with behavior on the parents, then that's a good sign. When you fail to see some of those changes and the parents are unrelenting in terms of their, the, uh, the denigration of the other parent right. and the conflict continues to escalate, then you have a problem. And it's when you have those situations that you look at more intrusive measures which could involve you know asking the parents or requiring the parents to go to counseling or ultimately getting a court order where it's required that the parents attend counseling or the children attend counseling well, as well. Well, then that, I, I can't resist the opportunity to ask you, how do you think the courts deal with high conflict 
uh, separations and divorces? I think the courts play a very important role in situations that are extremely high conflict because they provide external control to the parents. Once again, these are parents who have difficulty uh, managing or controlling the conflict. So what happens is there needs to be an external force. Sometimes the courts can do that, sometimes it's the police, but with respect to the courts, the courts give the parents an important message that their behavior is unacceptable and also that they need to develop other kinds of strategies. And also judges can be very helpful in terms of counseling or instructing parents that the impact of the, the conflict is, is quite detrimental. And when they do that, when the Parents, uh, most parents will, um, will look at that and say, I have to change my behavior. Some parents won't. I was just going to say that some of these cases go on for years. Uh, this won't come as a surprise to you. We have files that don't close until the child's 18. Absolutely. Until that child is an adult. It never ends. They fight over every, every Christmas holiday, every March break. Everything is cause for a fight. And I wondered whether letting the conflict go on that long, allowing them, giving them a platform in a courtroom to act out World War III is beneficial to, to them and to their child. I don't think it's beneficial. I think the role of the court is to control and extinguish the conflict where one can. Um, I think the court has resources in terms of ensuring that um, you know, parents get counseling. But um, where that doesn't happen, then I think the court has to make some def take definitive action. Thank you so much, Howard. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lauren McLean. Today on Q&A, our question is, my spouse just remarried. Can I finally stop paying support? Contrary to popular belief, the remarriage or repartnering of the supported spouse rarely immediately reduces the amount nor automatically cancels your spousal support. But it does have an important impact on reducing the amount and length of the spousal support paid. A new relationship can lead to almost immediate support cancellation in short to medium length first marriages involving younger support receiving spouses who have suffered limited career damage or foregone opportunities. But if you have a long traditional marriage to an older spouse, their remarriage is unlikely to immediately end spousal support. Although the amount may be reduced and the length of the payment may be shortened, the court will review just how serious and stable the new relationship is. It will look at the comparative financial means of the new spouse compared to yourself, remarriage to a rich new spouse is ideal for entering support sooner, while well, remarriage to a cash strap, one is not. So pray your spouse finds their new ideal mate quickly. Thanks for watching. For extended interviews and exclusive content, please visit our website at familymatterstv.com. If you'd like to submit your legal question to our Q&A, go to advicescene.com. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone. See you next time.